Hello again, welcome to part two of my review for the TPI 194.2. We're going to be looking at transient testing during this video. But before we get started, you can see I've got my antenna out. In the past, I've seen where some of the meters that I've tested were actually susceptible to RF at different frequencies. What I've been doing is sweeping the frequency while I'm varying the antenna position around the two meters. And both of these meters, I haven't found a sweet spot where they're affected. So that's pretty good. I've been using this TPI meter this week. I can tell you there's a few other things that I really don't like about the meter. One of them is this orange lettering on top of the green. The contrast is just really poor. I think it was a bad choice of coloring. Another thing I don't like about it is when you turn it off. I don't know if you can hear that. I'll bring the uh, meter up closer so you can hear the beeper. You can hear how the beeper kind of fades out as you turn it off. So I can imagine if that beeper were actually louder, that would be quite annoying. Another thing I had noticed I had failed to point out is there's no lead holder in the back of this. You'll see that like with the Bryman. you see the lead holders up here. Same thing with the X-Tech. See them in the back. I had pointed out in the first video where it has this nice recessed area where you can get your finger in. You notice that it's the same with the Bryman. This X-Tech I was going to point out, see it's got this little area here, and you can just get your fingernail under there, but boy, it pulls up really hard. I find myself at work, I'll actually take a screwdriver or pencil or something and jam it in there to get that open. We're going to start out the test end day by applying a 60 hertz rectified AC waveform, and this is going to be 220 volts. And we can see the meter is displaying uh, 232 volts DC. You can select the AC plus DC. You can see our AC component is 117, DC 232, AC plus DC 260. Next I'll rotate the selector switch through all the different functions and we'll see if it causes any problems with the meter. All right, I'll go ahead and functional test it. Well, believe it or not, this meter failed this test. In the resistance mode, when it auto ranges, it's reading uh, 1.3 meg. We'll just connect it up to a 0.5 ohm resistor. You can see we're in the ballpark. This is 50 ohms. Here's 1K. And here's a 100K, and you can see now it's getting low. Tried it at a meg. You can see it's switching the ranges. The diode mode appears to work just fine. You can see there's a single diode, two, three diodes. Here's a short. This is a 0.1 microfarad. This is our 150 picofarads. Conductance mode does not appear to work. I checked all the voltage inputs. Those all appear to be fine. The frequency input appears to be fine. The inductance and the temperature and the currents all appear to be fine. It only appears to be the resistance and the conductance that were affected. And then just partially. I'll go ahead and take this apart and we'll see if we can figure out what went wrong with it. What I've done is used a small piece of plastic here that I've made up for a washer. I'm using a nylon screw and a nut. This is essentially the front end of the unit. All of this circuitry here checks out. Something is definitely lugging this thing down. So the next step is to pull this metal can and we'll have a look. I end up just using some solder wick to clean up along these two joints. Rebent the tabs. Let's have a look inside. And the workmanship looks pretty good. Not seeing any visual problems with it. Looks like maybe there's another clamp up in this area. I wouldn't think that'd have anything to do with it. This is the main front end chip. 
It's made by Fortune, and it's a part number FS9704B-GCE. This is the RMS to DC converter. It appears to be manufactured by Analog Devices, and it's a part number AD636JHZ. I spent a little bit of time tracing out the front end of this. This would be our input, and it goes through two switches. This switch is only active when it's in frequency measurement mode. This one is active when it's in ohms or diode mode. It routes through a PTC. This is PTC2. Then it runs through two back-to-back -back diodes. And then there's a series of resistors. These will have a capacitor in parallel. And these all connect to that front-end controller chip. It's also a 100K in series with a 10K. And again, that goes to the controller chip. And then there's a, another 100K that connects off of this same node that also goes into the controller chip. If we kind of look at the uh, diagram here, these resistors are these resistors up along here. R14, the 10 meg, is sitting here. This 100K and the 10K, this is the 100K here. And the series 10K is along here. So I checked all the values of these resistors. Everything here appears to be just fine. I'm sure a few of you will ask about the two diodes. I had actually removed the Q1 to check this for leakage. Uh, this is definitely not an issue. I suspect I damaged this controller chip. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to find a replacement for this. I've gone ahead and looked at the circuitry a little bit closer. You can see right now I have the two leads disconnected. I'm going to go ahead and attach a 10 meg resistor. And you can see it's reading very close to 10 meg. This will be with a 1 meg. And you can again see it's very close. So I'll go ahead and remove the leads. And what I've done is I've lifted up R19. And I'm going to go ahead and just push that down a little bit. And we can see we read 1.6 meg. So yeah, it appears that the IC itself is leaking quite a bit. And I believe that's the cause of the problem. So again, unless we can get a new IC for it, I think the meter is not going to be repairable. It appears the fortune chip itself is leaking. I've gone ahead and reattached R19. And you can see I have a 10 mega ohm resistor attached and it's reading currently about 500k. This is looking at some of the data I've collected. Down here we can see the TPI summit meter. You can see it costs roughly $250. It's CAT4 600 volt rated. It has a resolution of 50,000 counts. It supports true RMS. It has a single temperature sensor. It's able to read conductance as well as millivolts and microamps. And it also has an AC plus DC mode. It passed the high voltage DC and AC test, but then when I ran the rectified AC 220 volt test, it failed. Besides the TPI, some of the other meters that have failed this test are the Unity UT20B. This was a small pocket meter. And also the TechPower TP2844R. I suspect the Summit would have also failed the ESD testing. And again, meters that have failed that are the UT181A, the Vichy VC99, the XTech EX530, and the Unity 61 d and e both failed that test. Looking at the continuity test results for the TPI, using a 50% duty cycle, the maximum frequency is somewhere over 10 kHz. The detectable pulse width is somewhere less than 2 milliseconds. Again, plenty fast. The resistance that it detects the short at is 42 ohms, and the open circuit is roughly 43 ohms, so again, basically no hysteresis. It's a non-latching type. Open circuit voltage is roughly 3 volts, and the short circuit current is almost a milliamp. Let's look at this meter compared with the Bryman. The Bryman is also a 50,000 count meter. It's also true RMS. It has two thermocouples. It also has conductance as well as millivolt, microamps, and AC plus DC. The Bryman passed all the way up to the 5.9 kV transient. It was then tested at 13 kV and it failed. So I never again went back and repeated these tests. But we can see that from a robustness standpoint that Bryman is far superior. And accuracy wise the two I'd say are on par with each other. 
I'd like to see Unity come out with a newer version of this 181 where they actually make it a little more robust. This meter actually utilizes some very nice parts, 60,000 counts, also has two thermocouples. You can see it failed during the static discharge test, but it did pass the rectified 220 volt AC test. Again, I was able to repair this meter, and then I went back and modified their design, and you can see I tested that all the way up to 15,000 volts with a 2 ohm source with a 50 microsecond full width half height. Mechanically, the 181 is not very robust. The lens for the LCD cover is pretty prone to scratching. And again, with the Bryman costing $230, if we added on the additional $40 or $50 for the serial interface, I'm not sure what TPI wants for theirs, but I would guess it's on par with that. But that would put these two meters on par with what the 181 costs. Initially, when I took apart the 194.2, you may remember I had pointed out four different PTCs. So basically they're using a couple of transistors back to back configured as diodes for the input protection. Obviously it's not enough to protect the input of this meter. I highly doubt that this meter would actually survive the ESD testing. And if we look at the cost, again the TPI meter is a little more than what this Bryman costs. Of course the Bryman can't do inductance, which the TPI claims it can, but you saw the accuracy of the inductance mode, it's not very useful. Again, this is not going to be a replacement for an RLC meter. So in my opinion, this Bryman is a far superior meter. It's a lot more robust. The update rate on the Bryman is much faster. The bar graph is actually quite usable on the Bryman compared to the TPI. You saw how much it skipped. Again, the data logging on this doesn't seem to work. I wrote the manufacturer about that problem. They responded that they were working with their engineering group. I've yet to hear back from them about that. If they do come up with an answer or a solution for that and I'm able to repair this meter, I'll do a follow-on video. Well, I think that's going to be it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Till the next meter.